And through the course of this talk, you'll see that I'll touch upon some of these, not all of these by any means, but if you're interested in picking my brain or chatting about any of this, you'll know where to find me. Right, so before I dive any deeper, I just wanted to pay due heed to the fact that I'm uh, a part of many folks in this broad wheel. Uh, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with not only these people you see on the screen, but many others are around the world and many of the things that we'll share is largely thanks to some very smart people who've also actively collaborated in these efforts. Now, who the hell is Sisyphus, Sisyphus right? Kalika recognized uh, the allude I made to a Sisyphean task, but I'm, with a show of hands, how many of us know what a Sisyphean task is? We probably all know what a Sisyphean task is. We probably just don't know that it can also be called that. So Sisyphus was uh, a founder and king of Ephira, which is present day Corinthia in Greece, right? And that, that's not necessarily the only reason he was really famous for and what he was known for. I'm pretty certain many of us have heard about this tale at some point. Story goes, Hades, who is the god of death right, and the king of underworld, punished Sisyphus because of some things that he did. What precisely? Well, he cheated death twice, right? How did he do it? Why did he do it? Let me leave that task with you guys to find out and figure out later on. But I'll tell you what the punishment was. Right? And this is something that you've probably seen before. Sisyphus was given the task of lifting up this gigantic boulder and hurtling it all the way up towards a mountain. But each time he almost got to the zenith, it kept rolling back down, right? So he'd have to get back on top of that boulder, put it on the shoulders and go all the way Hold that thought in the back of your heads because we'll circle back to that. Now, we're all familiar with this. So I'll dash through the next three slides because you know this is an audience which I assume is very familiar with how technological revolutions have rushed across uh, all kinds of domains from transportation to healthcare, finance and manufacturing and all of that. Again, an audience that will embrace the fact that uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT and GPT-5 models and well, GPT-5, this is more a joke. So Greg Brockman, who is one of the founders of the GPT-4 family, uh, I think one day later, uh, right after on the heels of GPT-4 coming out, started joking about GPT-5. And that's really the rat race we're a part of right now, right? There's no GPT-5 just yet, but the 4.5 and you know all the improvements have uh, captured the imagination of the tech world. Uh, a fair bit, and we're all familiar with all the hat conversations with many of you today about how this is a double-edged sword. As much as you know, there are a lot of positives that can be brought forth. There are also a lot of uh, dangers and unintended consequences that are that are, in fact, being unfolded right now. But if you don't pay due heed to it, uh, history has taught us many lessons about how things can go wrong. Right? Again, uh, I, I won't go any deeper into this because I'm sure we're all familiar with how. If you look at this from a historical perspective, right, we saw that there were a number of benefits that uh, giant leaps in technology brought to the fore. Think about how we went from a species that invented the wheel and changed our lives forever and then found out that you can do uh, magical things with the steam engine. We had the turboprop engine, the jet engine, and you know things have constantly uh, evolved and helped us as a species in realizing greater comforts in life. Right not for everyone equally, and that's often one of the big things we discuss, but there are a lot of things that also go hand in hand with those benefits and the costs that we've uh, traded off with often have uh, to do with things like uh, lives even, right? So war, for example, is one of those most drastic outcomes that uh, in many ways has also been ushered on by technological progress. Um, if you have uh, an inclination for movies, you probably appreciate that dilemma in Oppenheimer most recently, right? With, the atom bomb and how very often we as scientists in the space are uh, encountered with such dilemmas. Pretty sure many of us here are also familiar with these extremely uh, you know, biased narratives around AI. People have been looking at AI as either this uh, you know, magical oracle that will save you from all the problems in the world, but then there are you know, also these other alternative narratives around how this is going to end uh, human life as we know it and how AI systems are going to take over the world, right? I think the reality uh, lies somewhere in between, and uh, that's something that is also being uh, pushed forward as an alternative third perspective by a community that's slowly gathering traction around human-centered AI, right? And I resonate with some of the notions that Ben Schneiderman, one of the well-known HCI uh, pioneers, has also in his uh, 
view over human centered AI and what it should be. And I just like to you know spend a minute on this and say how AI and one of the perspectives of human centered AI is not necessarily to try and replace humans in some of the tasks that it that they're doing or just helping them uh, do other things, as is often claimed, right? Let's let's replace humans with AI so that humans can do other things, right? And what are the other things is is something that people don't necessarily often articulate. But I think as opposed to inventing these new realities which don't currently exist, why don't we amplify the abilities of humans who are facing problems right now and augment them with technology that can actually help them improve their productivity or improve uh, or solve certain problems that they're facing right now, right? And that's the so that's the view I have and share with uh, some others in the community. Just a very quick look on what human-centered AI can be and how we can build technologies. Again, uh, borrowing from this framework that uh, Ben Schneiderman proposed, he speaks about how human values should be at the forefront of understanding how we build uh, AI systems and technologies in general. He speaks about how AI should also empower individual goals. Individual goals can uh, be about a wide spectrum of things ranging from creativity to responsibility and social uh, connections. And you need to think about the design aspirations. Some of us think about these as attributes that we want to have or want our systems to have. Trustworthiness, safety, reliability, right? We hear these buzzwords being thrown around all the time. And when you talk about all of this, uh, it's important to reflect on the stakeholders who are consuming them, right? Quite often us as researchers and scientists as well, it's very easy to get married to the very core problem that we're exploring without necessarily thinking about, you know, the, the many steps later, which is what happens when these systems are, are being used by stakeholders, again, where, which is a pretty broad spectrum, right? And that's something to keep in mind. And not least the fact that this goes hand in hand with a number of threats that, uh, also are concomitant. So if you're interested in getting a deeper look at uh, Ben's framework and some of the ideas that were discussed around this, we also had uh, him uh, come visit us in an online capacity and you can follow up on that. But before I dive into some of the interesting things that you know I think we're doing and I'd like to share with you, I'd also like to talk about uh, the very difficult task of meaningful human control as you know, I like to think of it and as balancing the act of human control as you know, Ben and others have spoken about. And bear with me as I try to walk you through this dilemma of how we can try and imagine technologies that we're trying to shape and build across these two axes of automation and control, right? Again, uh, for those of us who have uh, been in this space for a while, we're probably familiar with the SAS levels of autonomy and you know how fully autonomous cars probably level whatever and uh, the amount of human control dictates different levels. Now, if you want to build tech, there is a room and space for technology. And if you divide this into you know, four quadrants for technology that has a high amount of human involvement or high amount of human input and control, but also a high amount of automation, right? Think about your vacuum cleaners, your uh, you know bots that move around and uh, clean up your place while you're busy doing other things, there is a fair bit of human control over it because you can you know, time them, you can uh, sort of dictate the paths which they should traverse. Your digital camera, that's an excellent example again. It's a really sophisticated, sophisticated piece of technology if you're so inclined to use it that way, right? So I'm, I'm not one of those, but I'm sure some of you are. And you can set your ISO settings and do all kinds of fancy things with the effect, all of that to make amazing pictures. Or you could just point and click, right? And it, does the job for you. So it gives you as a human the control to engage with it as you wish. If you were to look at other examples where you have a fair bit of human control, but there's no uh, automation whatsoever, think about your acoustic guitars or roller skates, which are objects you use to accomplish certain tasks, perhaps. And then you have this interesting space of applications where you have limited human control, but a fair bit of automation, right? Think of your pacemakers. And maybe that's also there because it's a desirable artifact, right? You don't want humans to have a lot of control over pacemakers because humans tend to err, right? And that could be quite fatal in many cases. And your airbags as well, right? So there's, I think this is an interesting lens to use while we're trying to build and shape technologies because it allows you to articulate what is the right amount of human control required in that particular application, right? And I think it's a, I'm leading with this because for the rest of the talk, while we're talking about AI systems and a broad elk of things, let's also constantly at the back of our minds question about whether or not this is something a human would want to be in complete control of, 
or is there an absolute benefit that can be achieved by ensuring that the AI systems are in perhaps a greater uh, amount of control? And then you have other examples that might fit in the last uh, quadrant. Now, what's important also to understand is that excessive human control is probably a terrible thing, right? Think about your pacemakers again. If you had a lot of human control over pacemakers, probably not a desirable um, aspect. But excessive automation is probably also not a good thing, right? Uh, imagine you have, uh, well, and, and we've seen a lot of examples in present day uh, automotive technologies that have, you know, thrown humans uh, control when they least expect it and only bad things happen then, right? So excessive control in any one of these counterparts is not something that we desire. So that's the important balancing act, which isn't very easy to do, but important to think about and design for. So what are the HCAI, human-centered AI attributes that are important? Well, these are some of the ones that, you know, the community has been exploring, uh, and not just one or two communities, right? All of us here can probably recognize these attributes that I've put up here on the slide, and we probably operationalize them in many different ways in our own work, right? If you're thinking from the spectrum of natural language processing, you can think about fairness in a very broad uh, way. You can think about safety, reliability, explainability, security, and lots of different ways. Because of the amount of time I have, I'll focus on two of these attributes today, trustworthiness and explainability. And just point out that this is at the intersection of AI and HCI, and I think it's very valuable to look at any of these problems from the from these two lens, right? It's easy to look at it only from the lens of the algorithm, which is a very valuable and important one, but we'd probably do injustice to trying to solve the problem if we were to limit ourselves to that. Right? I think looking at it from the lens of the humans is also equally valuable. And that's uh, the positioning that I'd like to have uh, for many, for most of the work that we do. Uh, I've used the word trust already, right? And uh, I'm pretty sure if I was to go around the table, ask each one of you to define trust in your own interpretation, we'll come up with a nice bag of diverse interpretations, which is nice to have, but also nice to understand what trust can mean and uh, in, in this broader scheme of humans interacting with AI systems, right? And this is a definition that I personally really like because it allows you to articulate and operationalize it in systems that you're also building. And trust here, as uh, proposed by C, is the attitude that an agent will help achieve an individual's goals in a situation that's characterized by uncertainty and vulnerability. Now, what does that mean? <coughs> Let's talk about this with an example. I'm sure a lot of us crossed the road today, right? I'm pretty sure all of us did. I, I had to cross it again in the building. There was no, uh, you know, zebra crossing, so it wasn't quite this, and I just jaywalked right past. But in a general setup, we've all crossed roads, zebra crossings. You waited for the traffic light to turn green, and you've opened, you know, crossed. And here in India, we've beaten it. We don't need that, right? So you guys get this better than most people. Uh, oh, I thought you you were asking. No, no. All right, cool. So imagine you had uh, a bunch of cars that are waiting for you to cross the road. Right? There's nothing that's stopping these people from running you down. But we as a society have built what's called a transactional societal trust in the fact that we'll all operate according to social norms or things that have come up and emerged. Right? So there is some amount of vulnerability when these gentlemen are trying to cross the road in the presence of some automobiles. Right? But they're crossing the road because there is some amount of uncertainty tied to it as well, which is, can I get across without being hit? And there's some amount of vulnerability. Will I die if I get hit? Right. So it is in this context that trust becomes most meaningful. Right. There has to be a cost attached. There has to be some amount of vulnerability and uncertainty. If you're measuring trust in contexts where there isn't any vulnerability or any uncertainty, I'd argue that it's not meaningful. Right. And what you're measuring is something else, and it's not trust. So what is trustworthy AI in that sense? Right. Now, trust itself does not imply trustworthiness, right? Just because you, you're crossing the road and you trust that this individual who's in a car will not run you down, it doesn't imply that this person won't run you down, right? So you have trust in this person or in the system, but it doesn't mean that it's trustworthy, right? So it does not imply trustworthiness. And the other way around, a trustworthy person doesn't necessarily beget trust, right? Now, it is in that spectrum of interesting concepts that we can articulate what is warranted and unwarranted trust. 
if you have an agent that is trustworthy and you trust it, you can think of that as trust that is warranted because you're trusting it for the right reasons. But if you have an agent that is not trustworthy, but it's still somehow manifesting trust in individuals interacting with it, that's unwarranted trust, right? So some of the desirable outcomes of trust are warranted trust, right? You want trust to exist when it's warranted. You have a reliable system and therefore this individual is relying on it. warranted trust. You want trust. You also want warranted distrust, right? You don't want people to distrust systems for the wrong reasons. You want them to distrust it when there's scope for distrust. You want to avoid the campsite, which is unwarranted trust and unwarranted distrust, right? Because that's all about technology adoption. Now, another very quick example on reliance in that space, right? So trust is often uh, spoken about and measured in both subjective and objective ways. Objective measures are often related to reliance. Can I trust this system? And if I do, will I behave in a way that will show me some evidence of your trust, right? Imagine you're using a GPS system that's powered by some AI technology, reading live feed uh, data, weather, and all of that, and telling you alternative paths or giving you suggestions about the speed limits. If you see, if you heed that advice, great, right? You're probably not going to uh, flag any speed guns on the way. If you don't heed it, you're probably stuck in some traffic, right? But these are low stakes situations. If you're, you know, doing this on an autobahn, there might be high consequences. And, you know, there's more metaphorical, but we get the drift, right? Another personal example over here, and you know, luckily I'm a consumer who's reasonably aware of how recommender systems work, but we can imagine how advice like this can uh, mislead people. So over here, one of my, so this was a year ago, probably chasing a deadline where I had very little sleep, right? And my Garmin device was telling me that my average night of sleep during the week was only five hours, while you get an average of seven hours on weekends. So working toward a consistent sleep schedule even through the weekends can improve your overall wellness. What's that telling me is that I should sleep for five hours on the weekend, right? So it's very easy for algorithms to make silly mistakes like those. And this is again, another low stake example, but we can imagine how this can have drastic consequences in a high stake. So why is it that I'm talking about trust for so long? What exactly is uh, the relevance to the context that we're all operating? In? So trust plays a central role in human AI interaction, right? So incorrect levels of trust can cause misuse of technologies, Cause disuse of technologies, which is also something we don't want. Imagine you build the most sophisticated piece of AI that exists, and this can really help everyone out. What good is it if it's just lying in a corner and no one's using it, right? So it's very important to think about the counter side as well. Who's going to use it? What's adoption going to be like? What can we learn from the goals of interpersonal trust? I gave you an example of how we as a society operate on a daily basis with interpersonal trust. What's there for us to learn from there and imbibe into uh, how we build interaction between humans and AI systems, right? And uh, yeah, just to elaborate on that, obtaining trust in someone makes life predictable. We, I think trust itself is not a goal, right? That's the key point I want to make in uh, a part of today's talk. Right? We shouldn't design for trust. That's not a goal at all. If you think about how we end up trusting each other, we don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, I want to go to work and trust for shop today, right? But trust is something that you want and use as a vehicle to collaborate, right? As individuals, that's how we lead our lives. So it's important to define the right goals as well, right? The end goal is not trust itself. Trust is a mechanism to help enable people to collaborate and make your life predictable, right? So interactions with AI systems, you don't want to just elicit trust in people. You want trust to be around and you want it to exist so that people can interact with the systems and benefit from them, right? So you want to try and support collaboration. Towards this end, and just keeping an eye on the clock, uh, I'll walk through a few examples where we've tried to explore how algorithmic systems, AI systems of different shapes and forms that are now being used in the society at large actually have an effect on the society at large, right? People haven't really thought about this deeply. Not everyone has thought about this deeply. There's an increasing amount of work in the space, and I think it's very important to understand what the downstream effects are before we go ahead deploying all kinds of AI systems, right? So in a collaboration with some uh, behavioral economists in Germany, what we did was we used a behavioral economics framework called the ultimatum bargaining game. Now, over the years, I've fallen in love with behavioral economics because of just how pure their 
experimental frameworks are and the rigor with which such work is pursued, right? And I'll communicate one of those examples with the ultimatum bar uh, For those of you who are uninitiated, let me walk you through what the game is. In the most simplest form, in a single shot ultimatum bargaining game, there is a proposer and there's a responder, just two players, right? Imagine the proposer is Kalika and I'm the responder, right? And Kalika, because it's a, what day is it? I lost track of time. It's a lovely Wednesday, uh, says, and um, while you're here, so here's one lakh rupees. Like, go ahead, do whatever you want with it, right? Um, and then it says, uh, oh wait, okay. So Kalika is the person giving giving me the money. She's not the proposer. I, I signed corrected. She says, here's a well, here's one lakh rupees. Do what you want with it, but you have to interact with Nana and you know make an offer to her because I want you guys to you know both benefit from this. And I'll be the proposer, right? So I'll say, hey, you know what, Nana? Kalika gave me this one lakh. Would you be interested in taking 20,000? And you know, you could say yes or no. If you said yes, you get that share of 20,000. I take the 80 grand and do something that's four times cooler. Or you know, you, you say no, and both of us do nothing, right? We spend the day talking about AI and drink coffee. <laughs> so that's how the game works in its simplest form. <coughs> now, what could happen and what you'd expect quite often is not what transpires, right? And hey, humans, the, the beautiful species that makes everything go in this area. And we've used this as a framework because of the fact that it's transferable in a lot of contexts, because we are constantly making decisions and bargains in cases where there is some utility function, right? What do you want to maximize? Do you want to maximize the split between both of us? Do you want to maximize the opportunity of succeeding in the bargain you're making, right? It's very similar to many of the uh, frameworks that you can attach this onto in the real world that we operate in. So you're looking at how does dependence on decision support systems affect the behavior of human stakeholders, right? So how do we do that? Well, we had we orchestrated a bunch of uh, interactions between humans who were playing the roles of uh, proposers and responders. And through hundreds of interactions, we gathered human data, right? We used that human data, trained a very simple uh, machine learning model to present some advice on what's the acceptable threshold you should make your offer over. So it's likely that you would get an offer that's acceptable. Simple. Now we take that model, stick it next to a proposer, and uh, you know, orchestrate the experiment again, see whether or not the proposers would rely on the model, you know, how this would affect the whole decision-making space, and also understand whether or not responders who are at the other end get affected by the fact that this person is using you know, this AI decision support system. <laughs> And long story short, what we found was that uh, perceptions of fairness changed due to the introduction of the algorithmic decision support system. Right? So earlier on, the person who was perhaps perceiving this to be a reasonably fair bargain would now think this is rather unfair, or there was a fluctuation in how perceptions of fairness uh, transpired in general. And a better understanding of what the ADM system actually is, so think explainably or explainability, but more from intelligibility, because you know there's a nuance over there can increase cooperation among players. Right? Again, long story short, we went a step further and we said, well, you have you know, a, a lot of people now relying on AI and you have situations like uh, wage negotiations. In fact, in employment, right? people are using AI systems for hiring, for culling the thousands of applications that are coming through and all kinds of things. Uh, and we often rely on these systems with two uh, main assumptions, right? And we say, well, the many promises of AI can save our lives in many ways, but there are two assumptions that we often sweep under the rug, right? Let me try and bring them to the fore. Condition one, and something that I probably alluded to in an earlier example, is that people do not actively avoid AI systems, right? Think about that example where there's a beautiful AI system that can solve all your problems. Your assumption of this will solve problems will hold if people do not avoid it in the first place, right? Think algorithmic aversion. We, we were all familiar with these contexts, right? So condition two is that AI systems do not systematically err in predicting human choices, right? As long as you can predict yeah. what the human's going to do, you can support and augment them. But if you don't systematically err, that's going to happen. If there is some systematic uh, error, then you know this won't hold. I won't walk you through the whole setup. We had you know a pretty elaborate uh, study with nearly 500 participants. And we took the ultimatum bargaining game to uh, next level, right? and we had uh, proposers and responders in, the, in a similar context. Except now the uh, responders 
could pick who they wanted to make this bargain with, right? Do you want to make it with a proposer who is, uh, you know, just the human proposer, or do you want to make a bargain with a proposer who is uh, taking the aid of an AI system, or do you want to uh, interact and bargain with an autonomous agent that's representing the individual, right? And turns out, and this this quite elaborate, and I can't do justice to the full depth that's in here. We also tried to articulate what are the actual beliefs. So this there's, there's a whole process of uh, carrying out belief elicitation. And uh, we also understood, uh, you know, what, what are the primitive beliefs of individuals in making each of these choices? And what we found is that humans tend to override their own economic interests <laughs> with a aim to avoid bargaining with AI systems, right? And this, again, is, is a context where we ran these experiments online with uh, probably a skew towards reasonably well-educated individuals who had access to computers and you know, uh, or probably liberal in their mindset. You can only imagine this would be a more drastic effect in a rural setting or in a setting where people have a lower amount of affinity to technology, or even more dangerously, it might be the opposite, and then there's absolute reliance, right? So that's uh, something to hold in mind. But there's also a surprising result because you know you can make a greater self, uh, you can make a greater economical gain if you're making a bargain with an AI system or, an, or a human empowered with an AI system, but people still chose to go down the other path, right? And that's the erratic human behavior, which you need to be aware of because not everyone's going to behave the same way. And that's not something that uh, we often think about deeply. I spoke about these key findings, so I'll breeze past and then talk about what all of this means, right? And is there a question? Yeah, I had a question from the previous slide. Go ahead. Uh, it's very naive, like maybe, uh, so, uh, you mentioned that people chose to avoid uh, bargaining with the AI system, right. even if that led them to uh, like less economic profit, in a sense. Right. Uh, how do you ensure like uh, uh, that the human actually trusts that uh, if they bargain with the AI system, they would be benefited? Like yeah, excellent question. And that's the belief elicitation uh, setup that I was alluding to. So participants were made aware of exactly how much they could gain if they made bargains with each of these systems. And they also, we had a phase where all of them had to go through a test almost to ensure that they all interpreted the belief elicitation setup correctly, right? So there was a way for us to acquire this information in a, with a higher level of abstraction, given I can't give you a very detailed answer now. Uh, we came up with a nice setup that allowed us to understand the extent to which uh, each of the individuals could make uh, a certain earning when they chose uh, you know, one of the corresponding agents, right? Uh, we can discuss this offline as yes. well. There's a very nice framework through which, it's called belief elicitation, and you usually use uh, what look like daunting tables, but it's essentially a table that uh, presents the gains that you can have with each of the choices that you can make, right? And that's how we did this. There's okay. a question on like, oh. It might be a very novice question, but just I, mean, I just out of curiosity, what kind of AI systems do you look at, and how do people actually, how can people actually negotiate with it? Like just just some high level idea would be very helpful to understand. Take sure, it. excellent question, right? And we use AI systems intentionally as a word that can mean many different things to many different people, and we're looking at people who are consuming these systems, right? Recipients of systems. So imagine not fully understanding what is happening uh, behind the black box. Uh, and, and that's predominantly the nature of interactions right now uh, in a lot of different uh, spectrums. So what's happening behind the scenes, of course, is a rather simplistic model that is uh, trained on, uh, you know, on, on data that we've gathered with the aim of having a certain amount of accuracy, right? So we also uh, don't want a fully perfect model because that uh, also doesn't, uh, hold any value when you're trying to measure how people utilize these systems, so on and so forth, right? Uh, that That's the nature in, uh, with which we, we sort of train our AI systems and our models. In the context of the work that was just done, you can think of, uh, yeah, you, it doesn't matter what the AI system is, right? Uh, the point is over here, the amount of gains that could be made are defined not by the AI system or the accuracy of the model, but based on the belief elicitation tables that are presented to the user. So it, it, it's immaterial of what the model is because you're already communicating to the user what the gain could be, right? But you make, you make a very good point because of course there might be effects of understanding 
these systems better or poorer, right? So, but, that, but that's the next question, which uh, we didn't explore in this particular piece of work. I don't really know where to look when I ask this question, but yeah. Oh, it's there. All right, cool. Thank you for the question. Anything else coming up? All right. In that case, I'll move along. And I love this fascinating notion of appropriate reliance, right? And I like it a lot because I think we'll be grappling with this for a while, right? This isn't a problem that will be solved anytime soon. And I'm, I can say this with some conviction because of what we're trying to do, right? So on its surface, it seems like a rather simple thing to pursue, appropriate reliance. I want people to rely on the AI system when it's correct. I want people to not rely on the system and perhaps rely on themselves or other entities if it's incorrect, right? Conceptually, very simple. Theoretically, meaningful. Practically, very difficult, right? So what is this notion? Now, if you think about representing appropriate reliance on AI systems or any AI in either a decision-making space or in a space of collaboration, you can break this down into uh, what has been really well articulated by Schema et al. in 2022. And they say, why don't we look at this from the lens of relative positive AI reliance and fit that against relative positive self-reliance? So what's the extent to which you rely on yourself over the AI? And how does that fit in con uh, you know, with respect to the extent to which you rely on AI advice? Right? So if you look at where appropriate reliance would lie, ideally in a uh, you know, in a, in a situation where that's possible to achieve, this is probably the area of appropriate reliance where you equally advocate your reliance behavior to those counterparts. Now, how have people decided to pursue this, us included? We've either looked at performance and accuracy, right? We've said that if, if you can tell the users what the accuracy of the CI system or this machine learning model is, can they then better rely on them? Can they get closer towards this realm of appropriate reliance? What about communicating the prediction confidence if it's at the instance level or if you're thinking about the global accuracy levels? What if we communicate this to the user? So stated accuracy or confidence and or uncertainty in making that judgment. Will, will that help? Explainable AI. Can explanations help? Can all the spectrum of all the magical explanation methods that you know the community has generated, can all of that help? And the method so far is that all of this sort of depends on things, right? And there are mixed, there's mixed evidence for how effective each of these spectrum of solution spaces are. So there's unclear transferability as well. And uh, for the rest of this talk, I'll try and reflect on you know, the, the field as a whole and how it's evolving and how we can potentially make it better, how we can come up with measures and metrics and evaluation uh, procedures that are more powerful, right? So this is more, I, I think this is the state of what people have to deal with for the imminent future, because these are grand problems, right? Now let's take a quick look at some of the things we've been trying to do to try and push that agenda a little further and try and push the envelope towards solving some of these problems. And uh, we drew inspiration on uh, from how people tend to explain things to each other, right? And we recognize that analogies, we as educators and as scientists, quite often use analogies to explain things to each other. And we wondered whether we could reduce the gap between a high fidelity explanation, which means, hey, this is a good explanation that truly describes what the model is doing. And the recipient being able to understand this so-called good explanation that your you know, explainer model or method has generated. Often that's the important gap, right? Because if someone's receiving an explanation, are they actually benefiting from it? That's something that we don't often think about. Are they actually understanding uh, and satisfying their explanation needs? Big questions, right? So we, so an analogy, if you're thinking about it uh, in, in a deeper context, it's a structural mapping of a target domain that you want to clarify to a recipient onto a source domain, which the recipient of the analogy is very familiar with. Quick example, imagine your, your favorite sport is cricket and you're very familiar with how cricket works. You're not entirely sure about baseball and how baseball works. I can now draw analogies from the sport you're really familiar with and try and use that as a means to explain how baseball works. Right. Now think about, and this piece of work was done while the pandemic was still well and truly on. It still is to an extent, but it's arguable, let's not go down that path. But we came up with certain analogies that we generated and sort of grounded in the ongoing public discourse. Right. So you can think about how people can refer to the accuracy of uh, a system and 
related to something that can arguably be well understood by the general public or by a particular spectrum of people, right? At that time, one can argue that uh, a subpopulation was probably aware of how accurate the AstraZeneca vaccine was and how uh, reliable uh, weather prediction system is, right? Because we interact with these things in our daily life. Now, can we draw analogies to these everyday phenomena to sort of impart a better understanding of what 75% accuracy even means, right? Maybe for a lot of us who've grown up with a deeper understanding of numbers and high numeracy levels, that's quite mundane, but perhaps the average layperson can't draw a lot of meaning in what 75% accurate system is. So uh, I point you to, well, read more here. Uh, in fact, this work was presented two days ago at CSCW. Uh, and what did we find here in a nutshell? Analogies aren't effective for everyone, right? You, you really need to make it personalized to draw the full value of it. You find uh, mixed evidence for how, uh, you know, the analogies we chose are also differently effective depending on whether or not people are actually familiar with it. Makes sense again. But if I'm not familiar with AstraZeneca, this would probably do nothing. But if you're familiar, would I uh, help you out in making certain decisions? How do you choose the analogy? How do you choose the analogies? Right now, in this piece of work, we came up with curated analogies without keeping the user in mind, right? So we assume that these are a subset of analogies that people should be generally familiar with. And we look it up in a, we, we orchestrate that in a between subject setup where we see, hey, to what extent is this analogy more effective than the other and the other? And then we learned that familiarity is an important mediating concept where construct, or depending on how familiar you are, it's more effective or can be perceived as being more useful or otherwise, right? And this was sort of the groundwork towards building uh, on top of, which is what I'll uh, talk about as, as we move along. And I'll also tell you where we're at with that piece of work right now, which is elephant in the room. And we use LLMs to magically solve exactly that question that Talika was just asking, right? How can we map, how can we generate high quality analogies in, uh, on the fly while interacting with the user through minimal interactions, right? Great, so I really like this piece of work because it's uh, a conceptualization of what a high quality analogy can be, right? So here we're looking at concept level AI explanations as a starting point. You, you have a whole spectrum of explanation methods that exist right now. We're all familiar with many of these, your lines, your shafts, and what have you, right? But you also have this breed of explanations that are called concept-based explanations, right? So you have, uh, if, if, whether it's your feature attribution methods or whatever else that's highlighting certain things, you can draw and draw abstractions and assign concepts to those attributions to try and create an explanation, right? That's a concept-based explanation. Now our question is, use it, if you have a concept-based explanation as a starting point, can I now draw analogies to that, to those concepts in a way that I can further the understanding and the intelligibility in the recipient group, right? What do we do here? Uh, as again, an example, just to communicate that idea. Imagine you have an input sample, you have a machine learning model that's making a prediction on, on a cancer diagnosis context, right? Imagine a concept of a cool explanation just says with cribriform and fused glands and needle core biopsy from the prostate, this is diagnosed as the adenocarcinoma of the prostate. Now, what your typical explanation methods will do is they'll highlight certain things, right? And say, hey, this is why this happened. Right? How good is it for a layperson? Maybe it's not helpful at all, right? But maybe what the layperson wants is also not to understand the full depth of what uh, the adenocarcinoma of the prostate is. Perhaps in this context, they want to know how reliable the diagnosis is, or is this a certain diagnosis or not, right? And again, for, for just humor me and leave out the aching question of why would someone even interact with the system to do this? Because believe me, this is happening, right? There are contexts where this is happening, where you have, uh, because of the dearth and expert doctors that are available to tell them that, tell them and explain them all of this, there are cases where there is a reliance on automated systems or WebMD and all kinds of situations where people have no choice but to turn towards such systems. So what if you could convey something using an analogy-based explanation by saying, hey, you have the concept-based explanation as it is, but let's take a long uh, analogy. Again, here, uh, you know, a toy example. It is like recognizing a unicorn due to the horn in its head, right? So you're sort of saying, if I, rec if I see a beast that has a horn in its head, it's definitely a unicorn. And, you know, I have similar signals here. It's definitely prostate cancer, right? That's the idea. Now, because I like visuals, 
let me communicate that again uh, with an analogy itself. Imagine, so what's happening right now in the real world is the family of explanation methods that have been proposed by various communities at the intersection of HCI, AI, machine learning, right? Is you have your explainer methods, which are arguably really good at serving experts, right? If you're already an expert and you understand this, this will help you debug your models or improve your models iteratively. But these aren't necessarily as helpful for everyone. Remember how, how I said, you know, we want to build AI systems to help everyone, right? Now, experts, well, they have their expert knowledge. So they can gladly use their expert knowledge and steer that ship and get across their water body and exert appropriate trust and reliance to an extent. What about non-experts? Lay, lay people don't have that magnificent ship that they can get on top of, right? All they have are a pair of shoes. And what we aim to do is build a bridge that they can use to walk across, right? And that's the analogical inference bridge that we want to build. Right, this time. <laughs> right, so... Again, I'm uh, jumping across a body of works, but I'm trying to build, uh, you know, sense to all of that. So stay with me. When we think about trust development, and that's essentially what we're talking about, right? You can improve an understanding of the system. Can you then foster appropriate trust in the system? And therefore, uh, elicit appropriate reliance. It's also important to remember that most of the work done in the space has often been through single interactions or single sessions. The real world, as I was sharing with some of you earlier today, and we resonated with that, is far from that context, right? Quite often we interact with systems across sessions over months sometimes, and trust and reliance is a pattern that changes, evolves over time all the time. So it's only fair to consider our explorations in a broader context. In fact, we should do that, right? There's value in understanding what happens in single sessions, but you should extend to also understand what happens beyond. Because there's plenty of work that has shown how first impressions are very impactful and how people uh, tend to use uh, systems, rely on systems. Uh, that's something that we explored in some of our work. We also looked at how the modality of explanations themselves can have a very impactful role on how they can regulate uh, behavior of users. Are you presenting the explanation in a voice modality? Are you presenting it in text? Are you showing graphics? Right? All of these things which uh, aren't necessarily questions that people pursue still have an impact. You can then think about, and I spoke about how I'm quite interested in conversational interactions, right? And I think conversational interactions as a modality are probably the future of how humans will interact with all kinds of AI systems. And in such cases, can we use metaphors in a powerful way to communicate and shape expectations of users? So what often happens is there's a gap between the expectation and reality. And when individuals are presented with AI systems and asked to rely on them, there's an expectation gap. Right. If I know the system is not reliable, I'll probably behave differently. But if I'm told the system's really good, I'll probably exhibit a different type of behavior. Right. So can I use metaphors that people understand? Yes. Are we deciding the reliability of the system based on the analysis that it provides? Uh, no. So as the starting point, uh, so going back to the analogy framework, remember how I said the starting point is the concept level explanation, the concept based explanation, right? Now, how good is that explanation is not necessarily what we're talking with right now. We assume there's a high fidelity concept based explanation, right? Because there's a different family of, that's a different family of problems. And we're not trying to optimize the quality of the explanation that's produced in the first place. Just trying to use that explanation as a starting point, but improve the intelligibility of that explanation to the end user. Uh, I'm a bit confused regarding how are you defining the reliability of a model. I mean, how do you define if a model is reliable or not? Is that what we're trying to define here? Or no, we're not trying to define the reliability of the model. Let's assume the model has some reliability. We want to convey that reliability in a fashion that's comprehensible to the end user. Yes. Right? And one way of doing that, perhaps, and in shaping expectations, is to use anthropomorphism or metaphors, design metaphors, right? So there's a very interesting body of work done by uh, Lakoff et al. in you know, social sciences where they've a beautiful book to read, right? It's very interesting on how, about how we as a species have evolved and all of us have different understandings of different things. And this is the great chain of being where, uh, you know, the, it sort of has this metaphorical structure and says God is, you know, the supreme entity that, uh, you know, lies at the top. And then you have humans. And as you go about in this chain, so an animal can do everything that a plant can and more. A human can do everything that an animal can and more. And a God, you know, so there's, some sort of uh, expectation that you as an end user have. When I say, hey, this AI is like a plant, this AI is an avocado, 
right? This AI is a baby. This AI is an expert trained professional, right? It shapes your expectation on what you can expect and how you can relate to it. And that can help you if you want users to be more critical, less critical, uh, expect more competence. So there's, there's also this very interesting model called the stereotype content model, which we spoke about recently, right? And we've done a fair bit of exploration in that space of how you can use design metaphors to communicate and shape expectations while you have users interact. And we've also explored whether replace now you can orchestrate interactions with systems using you know conventional GUIs. And you can also now replace those GUIs with conversational systems. Now there are lots of benefits of conversational interactions because because of the fact that we're also familiar with conversational interactions, there is this subliminal of trust that we sort of tend to carelessly assign to such interactions. Dangerous thing also for people and companies to misuse, right? And uh, almost abuse. But, but that's something we found. We found that people tend to trust conversational systems a little bit more than they do conventional web interfaces, even if you can achieve exactly the same thing in both these uh, contexts. So one big thing not to forget is when you're dealing with humans in any task is cognitive biases, right? So we also explored how cognitive biases tend to have a big say in this context. The Dunning-Kruger effect, for example, is uh, is a metacognitive bias, which I think many of us here are probably familiar with. So I won't spend time on that, uh, but I'll point you to this paper if you're uh, inclined to get a deeper understanding of what we did here. here. But long story short, cognitive biases play a very important role. The Dunning-Kruger effect in particular is very important to talk about because it's a metacognitive bias where people who are less skilled in a particular context also lack the standard and recognize the absence of that skill. Right now, imagine the context of individuals interacting with AI systems. We can argue that the larger majority of people who in our lifetimes will interact with AI systems are ones who don't have the expertise, right? I can argue that to my dead bit. I think that's a no brainer, right? But um, what does that mean? It also means these people are also ill qualified or ill suited just because of what we understand about human behavior and science that, uh, you know, they're not equipped with the skills to recognize that. So they might be individuals who think they're relying on the AI system perfectly well, but if there are no cues or guardrails built around it, they will never know that they're doing it really poorly, right? Again, more details. I'll skip over this because I'm pretty sure I'm going. Oh, I think I hit my time already. But if I can politely request a couple of minutes, I'll wind up with you know some thoughts. And I like to think of these as some of the major open challenges in the space, right? And a lot of this work, I, I think empir the empirical lens in an instrument is extremely important in understanding complex problems like this better. So I'm, a lot of this is really alluding to the empirical instrument as a scientific instrument to solve these problems, right? So one of the big things that uh, we're struggling with as a community, and you know, I, I, I can be brave enough to generalize this, say, say this is the state of where we're at, is the ecological validity of some of the empirical studies that we're really orchestrating, right? We often are bound by a lot of constraints. We, we can all talk about this all day long, right? But what that essentially means irrevocably is that tasks often chosen are not because of their virtue in the real world, but because of their availability, data sets or popularity. Hey, I'm using this data set because X, Y, and Z also used it. Right? All of us use that to you know, argue for our design rationale and choice grounded in on the on the you know giant on the shoulders of other giants which is a great virtue sometimes not always and stakes of tasks right we don't necessarily articulate whether or not there's a high stake or low stake, low stake humans behave differently in different stakes there's some amount of work now that's gathering traction here very important we haven't articulated whether or not complexity makes an impact uh, we have some work that's going on that's exploring prognostic and diagnostic tasks which means what's the extent of uncertainty present in the task itself, right? If I ask you to rely on a system to make a prediction on information that will not change, there's probably going to be some amount of uh, you know, reliance that would come up. But if I ask you to rely on the same system, to make a decision that might happen five days down the line, and there are all kinds of external factors that add uncertainty to that equation, equation like weather or whatever else, behaviors would change. And uh, we need to consider everyone, so I'll include it, guilty as charged, but I'm increasingly trying to expand that, uh, looking at populations that aren't easily readily available to conduct studies and publish papers, but are more important to make meaningful impact. Right? And there are a plethora of individual uh, differences, 
So experiments that only ask users whether they trust the model with no vulnerability evaluate neither trust nor trustworthiness. So if there's one message you want to take home, let that be that one. And some of the main methods you have to evaluate trust these days are you know, either subjective ratings, questionnaires, qualitative interviews. But I think one of the most important things that you need to cement or augment existing subjective methods with is behavior. So behavioral reliance should be used as a complementary method. Model. Otherwise, we're just measuring noise. I promised two slides, but clearly I have more. Let me finish with this. I have more, but I'll save that for another time. So understanding the ways of effective human AI decision making is laborious. Now, what's a Sisyphean task? We saw only a few hands go up earlier on, but I'm sure at this point we all get the drift. So a Sisyphean task is often one that's associated with tasks that are being laborious and futile. Right. So I asked the question of whether it's uh, you know, whether human AI decision making is a Sisyphean task. I'll argue passionately that it isn't. I'll uh, also concede that it's completely laborious, but I don't think it's futile, right? Because that's really the world that we're going to be operating in for a long time now. And I hope we can collectively make that a better place. Thank you. Questions? Any more questions? Living on borrowed time, so apologies. Online? Uh, I have one out of curiosity, like, uh, let's say that, how have you ever tried experimenting with an AI trying to convince a human to trust them in a way? Like, let's say you're talking to chat GPT, or if mm. you have a chat interface and uh, yeah. the, the person doesn't know if it's an AI or a human, and the person just assumes it's a human, yeah. but then the AI says, I'm an AI, and uh, then the AI has the task to actually convince them to trust them. Yeah, so uh, we have done a bit of work in that line. So that's sort of around in the space of persuasive technology, yeah. right? Where and you have uh, explicit persuasion. This is one of the examples you're talking about where you have an agent that's convincing the user one way or another. And you can also think about that as a metaphor for, or, or one of the operational operationalizations of the agent that you're characterizing. Do you want this? And you see a lot of that in explainable AI, right? Quite often, persuasion is a strategy that's used to force the hands of the end users. I'm completely against that for multiple reasons, especially if you let me ground it in an example in IR, right? Information retrieval. A lot of people have uh, done a fair bit of work on saying, let's nudge users to do X, Y, and Z, right? I, I think the whole nudge philosophy is one that's a dangerous one, although it's been widely propagated. There's a beautiful book written about it, very nice, very cool to you know use nudge as a philosophy to. Uh, embody and empower and recommend the systems with, but I'd much rather view that from the standpoint of boosting, right? Which again is very much in sync with the human-centered AI perspective of augmenting individuals, allowing them to have all the information they need to make a choice of what to do as opposed to direct them onto a path, right? So we have done some work about on that. If you have particular questions, we can, we can talk about that. I'm also familiar with other areas there, so maybe that could be interesting. Uh, the reason I asked that was because uh, even we as humans have bias against AI, and a lot of us do not want to trust AI in a way. But as technical people who really work in AI know that what AI is capable of, yes. we as experts in AI can make better decisions. So how can you, how can I lame and trust an AI in that way? So that is right. So the, uh, I sense that we have to take this question offline. So yeah, let's let's just take this. Yeah. 